Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the latest edition of the Woke Bros. Of course, I'm your co-host, Big Waz. Join this week. We got a special guest this week. Our partner and comrade Nando Vila is out this week because of personal issues, thoughts, thoughts with Nando and his family, everything straight. But, um, you know, he's taking care of something and being with his family out in Miami, Florida right now. So, you know, we send our thoughts to Nando. We love you, brother. Um, can't wait to see you again. Uh, but on this week's show, we got a special guest, a recurring guest, my man, Long Island's own Daniel Bessner, who is an honors associate professor at the University of Washington. Shout to all my UW homies, Jake One, uh, Kevin Pelton, two legendary UW cats who are very dear friends of mine. Um, with a concentration in international history, DB, from what I understand, <laughs> you're a historian, a real life, true to, true blue historian. Welcome to the show, my man. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Waz. Uh, ha- happy to be here. Sad to not be here with Nando, but happy to replace him. Of course. Um, DB, but the people need to know, how does one, do you just start calling yourself a historian and people just fall in line and go along with it? How do you earn the moniker historian? It's a good question. I mean, basically you go to undergrad, you major whatever you want to, uh, and then you go to graduate <laughs> school and you get a master's degree in history. And then you're really a historian when you get the PhD or the doctorate, the doctorate in philosophy. Mm. So, so wait, you got a doctorate in history? I have a, I'm a doctor. Uh, uh, yes, I have a doctorate. <laughs> also, I want the people to know that DB um, is a proud graduate of Columbia University. The other day, he tried to convince me and Nando that it was just as prestigious as Princeton or Yale. Or I said just the love. It's just the love. <laughs> it's Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, in my opinion. <laughs> and so there you have it, people. On this show... Oftentimes we uh, we make fun of we don't make fun of, but we, we you know, we we scold the elites for being elite. And DB is a tried and true Ivy League elitist MF. Please send him your death threats on Twitter, people. No, I'm just kidding. We love DB. He's one of us. Um, He's down in the fight, down in the mud with us. So we love DB. Anyway, on today's show, we're going to take a little bit of different approach. Generally. Um, We have some current events topics that me and Nando try to sort of parse through and give the people a better understanding of it. Um, But today I wanted to have a sort of more more, uh, free flowing, a looser conversation because we do have DB on here because he is a true blue um, historian and his specialty is international history. I thought we would get DB up here to talk about U.S. foreign policy. Um, where the sort of ideas originate from and why we've basically been playing the same damn game for like a hundred years now, as it pertains to our posture globally, globally, um, you know, vis-a-vis other global powers and, you know, what crafts our foreign policy, who, what are the ideologies that craft it, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so DB, what I wanted to do when I started today's discussion with you, man, um, there was something specifically that I wanted to talk about, and that was U.S. hegemony. Is that how you say it? Hegemony. 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 See, I don't even know how to say this shit. Is literally, you know, you read it all the time, and it's just this idea that the the, the principle or the ideology or just the the dogma of U.S. um hegemony uh is 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 basically the guiding practice around so many things that we see when it comes to our behavior abroad specifically specifically when it comes to stuff like uh the vietnam war the cold war uh the reason why we have three trillion army bases all around the world whereas everybody else is like four um you know what i'm saying like all of those things so please db i know i've been gas bagging for a long time right now um please explain to to the people just the concept of u.s hegemony hegemony and you know where it comes from etc etc sure uh well the word actually is is a greek origin 
origin, uh, and it refers to the uh, Athenian Empire in, I think it was 5th century Greece. So it, it refers to, to two basic concepts. Uh, the first concept is what one thinks of when they think of traditional power politics, control over a region. Uh, and you could understand the entire history of the United States as, be about, uh, as being about the, the slow expansion of that sort of hegemony. So you think about uh, the first landing in, in the 17th century and the setting up of the 13 colonies, uh, and then the move <laughs> westward could be thought of as a foreign policy move. Uh, so mm -hmm. yet the first big move is getting hegemony over the entire continent of what becomes the United States by essentially uh, indigenous genocide, indigenous dislocation and, and, and relocation, uh, built of course up, upon uh, the exploitation of slavery uh, and the exploitation mm -hmm. of wage labor and blah, blah, blah. Then you get another um, level of hegemony that occurs over the course of the 19th century. Wait, before, before, we, before we go on, right? Um, basically the policy being, I, I feel like the policy is that if we're going to be here, we need to dominate it. Right. So just the idea that there, this vast land out West that's ungoverned by us and not overseen by us. And, you know, we're not basically exploiting that can never be the case, especially specifically not on our own damn continent. Right. And so this gets into questions of colonialism, and there actually are different types of colonialisms. Uh, what makes British colonialism unique is that it's what it's called, at least in the New World and Australia and New Zealand, settler colonialism, where the purpose mm. is to settle a, a, a given geographic space. Uh, Spanish colonialism and what is now Latin America is a different type of colonialism. They 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 imbricate themselves more in the community. They use pre mm. powers centers. That's not what happens with the British. Um, they developed ideas of race and ideas of British cultural hegemony, and they really want to settle the continent for Britain. And so they develop hegemony over the, the entire continent over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries. Got you. So, so would you just to go back, just to, just so we could go just a little bit slower for the listeners, so they can you know just understand exactly what what it is you're saying. You're saying the Spaniards when they went out and did their level of colonization, they more basically ingratiated themselves within the existing order of those populations. Yes. So if you think about it, um, Mexico City was the the capital for the Aztecs and. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I can't believe it. In, in Peru, uh, Lima was, I believe, the capital of the Incas as well. So they, what you have is the Spanish taking over pre-existing bureaucratic structures. Um, mm. Indigenous society is different in what is today the United States, but also British colonialism is different. And they embrace over the course of decades um, a, a more genocidal, a more exterminationist settler colonial project. So today, other settler colonial societies are Australia, I mentioned, New Zealand, I mentioned, but also Israel and also South Africa. So there's a, a strong link historically between settler colonialism and more extreme violence, more extreme forms of colonialism. OK, and so we started off with, <laughs> you know, basically as as it pertains to the United States, their expansion west being the sort of first idea of it. Um, and then what happens after that as it, it pertains to abroad? So basically over the course of the 19th century and particularly after the war of 1898, which is in the late 19th and early 20th century, the United States becomes the dominant power in the entire Western hemisphere. If you've heard of the Monroe Doctrine declared in, a, of course. in I believe in 1823, um, that's basically saying to the European powers, stay out of the Western Hemisphere, it's ours. However, uh, for most of the 19th century, the United States actually wasn't powerful enough to keep Britain out, to keep Germany, <laughs> to keep France out. But by the late 19th and particularly by the early 20th century, it becomes the reality that the United States is totally in control of the Western Hemisphere. And before I go on, I just want to emphasize, this is why it's kind of silly whenever people refer to isolationism, because the United States was never isolationist. First, it expanded West, and then it expanded to control the entire Western Hemisphere. And people who we today consider isolationists were actually just arguing that the United States should only dominate the Western Hemisphere and not dominate the world. So I just want to make that point. There never really were isolationists, <laughs> unless you consider Latin America to be not worthy of speaking about, which frankly, a lot of racist Americans did. But from today, we could see that that's not isolation. 
Right, it's like the idea of somebody saying, well, I'm not a violent person. I don't go out and beat strangers up. I only whoop my wife's ass. Exactly. The, I mean, this is like that's, I'm not violent. I, you know, I'm allowed to do that to my wife. She's mine, she's my property. Right. And, and that's, that's basically what isolationists would consider isolationism. But, yet, but we move on. Right, right. But, so that's what it is. And then it's after 1945, after World War II, a few things happen. Uh, one, uh, the, the, Euro the European colonial powers destroy themselves. Uh, Germany, Nazi <laughs> Germany destroys itself in this horrible war. Great Britain and France are destroyed in the war. Uh, the Soviet Union's even uh, pretty weak by the end of the war. But the United States is separated by two famously gigantic moats, the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and so uh, th this, what, what we call free security, it didn't really have to worry about being invaded, allowed the United States to, uh, uh, to develop an enormous arsenal. And also it had you know, a lot of raw materials and big industry, et cetera. So it develops this enormous arsenal, uh, and this arsenal uh, essentially allows it to begin to develop the basing system that over the course of the 20th century, second half, allows it to dominate the world. And today, Waz, as you gestured toward, we have 750 bases. China has one, maybe two. Uh, <laughs> Russia has two, somewhere between 15 and 21. Um, so it's really the United States has what we call hegemony over the earth. But this is only referring to the power political hegemony. There's another type of hegemony that I could talk about in a second, unless you want to say anything before that. Um, no, we'll get we'll get into that other one for, for sure. And, you know, because because we're taking a, a brief uh, journey down memory lane down United States history as it pertains to United States foreign policy or what we call, quote unquote, United States foreign policy. Um, after World War One, uh, very pretty quickly after World War One, we get into the Korean War, and you might ask yourself, "What? Do, what, what? I mean, World War Two? Excuse me. Uh, we get into the Korean War, and one might ask themselves, DB, what the hell is the United States doing in Korea? What, what do we have to do over there? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. So the period between 1945 and 1949, a lot of different things happen. Um, I would say there are three things that are most important. One, um, the alliance between the United States and Soviet Union breaks down, and both Americans and Soviets begin to view each other with increasing suspicion. Mm -hmm. um, I think in particular the death of Franklin Roosevelt is really critical because Harry Truman, who succeeded Roosevelt as president, is not as sure of himself, and he really wants to look tough to the Soviet Union, and I think that didn't result in anything good. It just fractures the U.S.-Soviet alliance. That's uh, one. Two, in 1949, the Soviet Union gets an atomic weapon. So this it really freaks out Americans who, of course, got atomic weapons in 1945. They dropped them on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But when the Soviet Union gets an atomic weapon, Americans are like, oh, my God, they could destroy the world and they're evil communists. That really freaked Americans <laughs> out. Uh, and then literally right after, within weeks uh, of the United States finding out in September 1949, that the Soviet Union detonated an atomic weapon, Mao Zedong's communists win the civil war in China and push out Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists to Taiwan. So the quote-unquote loss of China, coupled with the Soviet acquisition of atomic bombs, coupled with the degradation of the U.S.-Soviet alliance, basically sets the stage for a Cold War. So um, mm -hmm. when uh, hostilities break out in Korea in June 1950, there, there's like a very complex set of issues, but essentially um, hostilities break out between the North Koreans backed by the Chinese, the People's Republic of China, Communist China, uh, versus the UN really uh, led by the United States. There, the stage was already set to have this battle between two ideologies. So what the K Korean War does, it, it essentially gives um, a reason for people who are becoming increasingly fanatical, increasingly a hard line about the Soviet Union, the excuse to basically turn the American state to be a permanent wartime state, to increase defense funding, to begin thinking about a draft, to begin building more weapons, to begin building more. Because the Soviets um, helped the, the, uh, the communists basically with that war. Right. And and I want to ask you something, DB, because as you're talking, something immediately arises to me that seems to not make much sense to me. How can the United States be both 
completely isolated from everybody else because of, like you said, the, the natural moats that we have with the Pacific and Atlantic, but also deathly afraid. That doesn't, those two things don't seem to jibe with me. That's a great question. And the, and the answer is the, the, the airplane. Um, so in the 1930s, you get the development of long range bomb bombardment, right? Planes that are able to fly mm. a really long time and drop bombs. Um, and that's really it, right? So you, you get in the in the 1940s, beginning even in World War II and continuing after, all mm. these Americans are doing very complex geographical analysis about, you know, how could you go over the Arctic to reach the Soviets or how the Soviets might one day be able to deliver bombs to you. So it's the invention of the bomber. And then oh, over wow. the course of the 1950s and especially the 1960s, the, inter, the uh, invention of, of intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, and so, a- so, so just, just to um, jump in really quickly, um, you know, cause a lot of people, it's, it's very easy for people like us, um, people who consider themselves to be leftists to view everything as some type of capitalistic plot, right? Like not that they were actually scared, but they pumped fear into people to justify their actions. What you're saying is that they probably were pretty scared of what the Soviets were capable of at that time. Um, so I would say both are true. I would say mm. our capitalist imperatives to dominate the world, particularly to keep over uh, open shipping lanes, right? The, the British Empire had kept open shipping lanes. And the United States is freaked out that they're not going to be able to access the Pacific if the shipping lanes are closed by the communists. <laughs> Um, so capitalism is important, but they're also freaked out. They did just fight a world ending war with Nazi Germany. And Joseph Stalin is kind of a wacky leader. You don't know what Joseph <laughs> Stalin is going to do. But the Soviets really didn't have the capabilities at the time. So I think that most Americans were just afraid of the potential. And this becomes mm-hmm. a recurring theme that Americans over the course of the 20th century are less afraid of what is actually possible right. or afraid of the potential. And I think that's operating right after World war two right and so you know we have the, the 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 korean war which again a lot of like for whatever reason it gets short shrift even though it's basically a direct connection to vietnam which we all recognize in as, as an atrocity and one of the most horrible things that's ever happened in human history um but it's it's the connector right it's the inciting event of what would become a forever freaking war with the Soviets and quote unquote communism as a whole. Right. And so what the Korean War does, it, it, do, it does a couple of things. What you have to remember, Japan is occupied, right, by Douglas MacArthur, who essentially rules. Uh, he, he's actually fired by Truman in the Korean War. But the important thing is that it's clear to the world that the United States is going to become the preponderant power in East Asia. And this is actually the source of the mm-hmm. U.S. China fight today. Right. The United States has been since 1945, the major power in China's backyard. Right. So literally is the equivalent of China coming to Mexico is the the U.S. going to Japan. So this is the tension between China today, which is there. China's like, okay, it's not 1945. We're not super weak anymore. Why are you the top power? And the U.S. is like world peace depends on us being the predominant power. And it really starts with the Korean War a little earlier, really starts with the Korean War and continued through Vietnam and after. Right. And so, (laughs) again, this this idea of hegemony um, in Vietnam specifically, where, uh, (laughs) you know, that's when you start hearing this word, quote unquote, containment. Right. Like the idea that the the commies win in Vietnam is going to get so creeping and they're going to come in and do this and they're going to take over. (laughs) They're going to take over the Philippines next and then it's going to be there and then it's going to be on Florida. They're going to eat our kids with communism in Florida. And so Vietnam, which again, I think is obviously everybody understands is a watershed moment because one, the Americans so clearly failed and lost and embarrassed themselves and prolonged it. And just so clear, like it was so clear from so very early on that they could not win, quote unquote, in a traditional way. Right. Like you weren't going to get like uh, the way uh, Hitler surrendered and, and all of that stuff. And, and Mussolini and all these people had to basically lay down their arms and say, we surrender. You guys are our kings. We're sorry. We, we didn't mean to do it. It's uh, it's our bad. And you could do your little uh, show war trials and all of that stuff. Right. Like it became clear very early that that just was never going to be the case 
in Vietnam, but yet they continued with it. Yeah. So containment begins really right after World War II when a famous guy named George Kennan writes something called the Long Telegram in February 1946. And he essentially argues that the Soviets, like the Russians before them, are super paranoid and Marxism and Leninism is a world encompassing ideology. So the Soviets, Kennan argues, view everything as just war, that no matter, even if they look like they're going to make peace, it's really, they're just waiting for the fight. So uh, the idea is that anytime the Soviets make a move, you have to contain them because if you don't, like you said, they'll be in Florida tomorrow. Um, So this becomes a very powerful ideology, again, particularly after Korea. And it looks like the the communists are really trying to make inroads. Um, So what happens in Vietnam is a bunch of different things. Uh, First, you have to remember Vietnam was a French colony for, for, uh, I think, a about a century. Uh, France loses um, half of the country, what becomes North Vietnam in 1954 after the Bia- Battle of uh, Dien Bien Phu. Uh, and the United States essentially allows Vietnam to be divided into two, a North and a South. Um, however, the United States basically funds the South. The Republic of Vietnam um, supports its leaders, gives them weapons. And eventually, after the Gulf of Tonkin resolution of, of 1964, I believe if I get that day wrong, that's that's insane, but I'm pretty sure it's 1964, um, begins escalating um, by bringing in troops and increasing bombing in Vietnam. So the problem that I think most historians would say is that the Americans were viewing Vietnam, the sort of nationalist struggle in Vietnam as a struggle for communism, when it was really a struggle for independence and nationalism. So you have an ironic situation where a country, the United States, which prides itself on being the first anti-colonial country in the world, founded in an anti-colonial revolt against Britain, basically preventing um, the the, the Vietnamese from uh, living uh, as a fully independent country by essentially funding the government in the South. Now, there's questions as to what degree is the government in the South legitimate or not, and there's a lot of different debates, but it is pretty clear that barring uh, basically permanent commitment with boots on the ground or something extreme like tactical nuclear weapon use, it was very difficult for the United States to be, to, to win that war. And they wasted an enormous amount of, of blood, um, it's not only of Americans, but especially of Vietnamese, uh, both soldiers and civilians, uh, and, and an enormous amount of money on these points. And again, to this day, obviously half of our budget goes to the military, even though, you know, that amount of money spent and everybody knows that one that it dwarfs the amount of money spent on no country's killing machine costs anywhere near as much as ours does like it just there's no there's no freaking comparison right and you know so that same paranoia funds that that same paranoia fuels that excuse me that same paranoia of the russians and the encroachment of communism fuels um, a cold because, you know, essentially Vietnam is considered a proxy war right between us and the Russians via these poor people in the um, in Vietnam. And can't forget about Cambodia and Laos because those people got freaking decimated by this shit. Um, and then but you see it manifest itself again with the same ideas. Right. Um, before that, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, which, again, we carried on. Until basically President Obama from 1950, whatever it was, when Castro took over, um, and that was 2010, whenever the Obama-Cuba thing was. Uh, so there's like 60 years of this shit with Cuba. Based on the idea that these commies kicked out our guys in Cuba, um, and we can't have that. We can't have commies you know, essentially a few miles off of the South Florida shore. And so we're going to just freaking be at war with them forever. And, you know, we everybody knows about the Bay of Pigs, all of that in service of we can't have commies over here. Yeah. And in honor of Nando uh, being in Miami, uh, what's really interesting about Cuba is that most historians, uh, in my understanding, would argue that Castro wasn't, in fact, initially a communist. He was on the left and he wanted to do redistributive programs, but it was the Americans couldn't take the insult of losing, losing, quote unquote, Cuba. So they were so harsh to Castro after the 59 revolution in 59 and 60 that they essentially pushed him into the hands of the Soviet Union. And so right. I, right. Those were the only friends that he had. He had to do it. He had to do it. Otherwise, he was going to be. And you know what? Castro 
had a lot of problems with Castro. I don't want to get into that now, but he was right about the fact that they needed the Soviet Union to survive. And Castro, and he, and he was a political leader who, who manipulated the, the, both the United States and his own political bureaucracy to stay in power until his death, essentially until his death. Right. And so, again, the same the same craziness that went on in Cuba, like that was just the, the, the Cuban, the Bay of Pigs. I mean, that's that's egg on your face. That's on the first page of the book of United States egg on your face. Um, the Bay, Bay of Pigs, of course. And we don't got to go much further than Cuba. We can go down to South America, what they did in Nicaragua and Honduras, um, El Salvador, et cetera, et cetera. Funding, you know, some of the most vicious um, militias, uh, some of the most crazy psychopathic people that man has ever known and backing them. And also not to mention like this, not like uh, because a lot of times when you hear the United States flexing their muscle abroad, it's this idea like you just mentioned um that we're trying to spread democracy because democracy is the will of the people. And oftentimes they're always subverting the will of the people on the ground, because guess what? It's not in the interest of America or what the, or what the American uh, power military establishes is, you know, in the interest of America. Right. And, and of course, famously, right after the uh, right after World War Two ends, the United States ensures that the communists don't win in France and Italy. And this is actually the first big one of the first big CIA operations. And this mm-hmm. demonstrates to American policymakers that, oh, we could use the CIA to do what we want. Uh, then in 1953, uh, along with the British, the United States overthrows uh, the democratically elected socialist government of Mohammad Mossadegh in Iran. And then in 1954, they overthrow the government of Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala, uh, Allende in Chile, um, <laughs> various, you know, the United States is also constantly pouring money into these countries and in, ensuring elites win. Uh, and then, like you said, the death squads in Central America, in the early 1980s. And of course, the United States is a major funder as far as I'm aware of the drug war that's going on in Mexico today. And I just want to say two things. Uh, The United States has a long, long, long history of intervening in Latin America going back to the 19th century. But as recently as World War I, Woodrow Wilson invaded the Mexican city of Veracruz. You know, the United States in the the 30s and the 40s supports uh, horrible dictatorships in, in Nicaragua and Guatemala. It does it again in the 80s. So I think this is a, a trend, not dictatorship, but that's quite. But this is a, a trend that one sees throughout U.S. history of the support of these very anti-democratic movements, and it's essentially due to a couple of reasons. One, um, racism, right? You know, it's just I, I think this is real. It's not just capitalism; it's also racism. Uh, the lives of Latin Americans are just less valuable to a, American policymakers and other lives. You could say the same about uh, Arabs today in Iraq, of course, Af- yep. Afghani's in Afghanistan, uh, and then it's also the fact that the United States just thinks that uh, genuinely these people really think that world peace depends on them and that they're going to have to get their hands dirty to ensure that world peace, you know, survives. But I would say, and then I'll stop talking about this, but I would say that one of the ways that liberalism, the idea that like the United States as a liberal government needs to govern in that way, one of the reasons it's able to function is because it has enemies. Um, so first you have like the racialized enemies of the 19th century, the 20th century, then you get Nazis and get Soviets. After the Cold War, you get like fighters. Uh, then after the, after 9-11, you get Islamists and then mm-hmm. you get China. Right. So we basically go from enemy to enemy to enemy to enemy to make ourselves feel good, to justify our brutal hegemony um, by pointing to an enemy that would supposedly be worse than the United States. And oftentimes maybe they're right. But I think that it's important to identify this phenomenon as it works. So, again, that's DB. You are so freaking good at this. Um, And the reason why I say that is because I wanted to talk about all of this stuff historically, because to me, we're still doing it. <laughs> right. Like we're still as a country, um, the, the war machine, the killing apparatus is still sort of asserting itself in the exact same ways today. Right. Um, you talk about them overthrowing um, the, the democratically elected government in Iran. Right. And then <laughs> the brutal Shah being overthrown by the people over there and literally We're still carrying out the grudge over it. This happened in the 70s, DB. 
Right. And that that same, you know, uh, that same grievance is why, you know, today I'm reading in the New York Times that Israel and Iran are playing these little nasty little games of shooting each other's ships in the sea. Right. And of course, we know that Israel is probably our greatest ally, if not Saudi Arabia or the ally who we feel most um, sort of uh, indebted to. I don't know. I don't know how you would call like I always tell this story, DB. I remember one time watching um, Barack Obama give a speech about Israel and he went on about how we got to protect Israel. We love Israel. The, the, oh man, Israel it's, it's just so great. The Israel people in Israel and Israel, Israel. And he went crazy. And I, I just remember watching this. I was like, yo, you know, he couldn't get up there and say that about black people. Like the way that he was saying it, like the effusive, like dedication and fealty. I was like, yo, this man could not talk about black Americans that way in public. He just could not. Um, It just I don't know. It just struck me like the way he just could be so just effusive in his like, oh, we got to do it for Israel. So, you know, obviously Israel um, is is our ally and they have been basically since that since the settlement happened. Right. Um, and of course, Saudi Arabia. But I see, you know, because we still have sharp elbows when it comes to Iran and Israel is our people. I, I'm looking at this and I'm like, is is Israel trying to get us into a war with these homies? It's a very interesting question. So the U.S.-Israel relationship, Israel's founded in May 1948. It goes up and down, you know, for the first few decades. People supported more, they supported less, they supported more, they supported less. And really the, the last administration to be a little bit critical of Israel was the George H.W. Bush administration that really didn't let Israel do whatever it wanted. But after that, since Clinton and since the signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993, Israel has been, you know, I would say the major U.S. ally with Saudi Arabia. They're probably equal. Um, and this is a very big question. I think initially, um, I, I think uh, American Jews, of which I am one, were very pro-Israel, particularly in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. Hold on, DB. Don't get canceled by the, by the Jews now, no, 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 DB. No, no. Don't, be a, actually, don't be a bad Jew right now. But I actually think in more recent decades, I would say since the, the, the turning on of evangelical Christians in the 1980s uh, with the mm. Reagan administration, my understanding is that today it's actually evangelical Christians, um, philo-Semitic evangelical Christians who have a particular theological connection to Israel, who are really one of the major reasons why the United States across both parties is so supportive of Israel. So I think the history, you have to really look at the history and see how it changed over time. Um, but today, I think the United States ha likes having a, a, a incredibly stalwart ally in the Middle East. It likes having an ally that that is very, quote unquote, Western in orientation and in, in a neighborhood, quote unquote, that isn't. Um, and there's not, it's not that costly for the United States to maintain an alliance with Israel. And it's not a political problem. One thing that's mm. interesting is that I would say the left has totally lost on the Israel-Palestine issue. And we should examine mm. why. Why 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 weren't we able to, to you know, really champion um, the, the causes that we might? Um, and it's a very complex question. But I think what you're going to see going forward is just, you know, stalwart support for the Saudis and, and the Israelis against Iran to ensure that Iran doesn't really become hegemon in the region. So <laughs> that's what I was just about to ask you, DB. Like, if tomorrow the U.S. basically, first of all, Israel and Saudi Arabia, like, y'all not the tail wagging a dog. If the U.S. literally really decided to tell them to go fuck themselves tomorrow, that would be that. They couldn't do squat shit about it, right? Like, there was there would be no consequences in reproduction, particularly when it comes to the Saudis, where, you know, the reason why all of that dick sucking started in the first place was because, you know, we had all of these factories and all these cars and they all ran on oil and gas and yada, yada, yada. And they had all of it. Um, that's no longer the case. We don't need we don't need Saudi for anything like realistically there's no reason why we should be dominant in the middle east there's no resource to extract anymore it like it does nothing for us so we could just leave forever theoretically if we wanted to so what's the point of all of this if besides the fact that the israeli and um saudi lobbies are as powerful as 
any fucking lobby in Washington. But like strategically, what are we really talking about here? Well, I, I think the lobbies are a powerful uh, explanatory factor, but they're not the only one. I think an institutional inertia is really important. I mean, these have been allies of the United States for a generation now. Uh, the Saudis a generation plus. So there are people who have spent their entire, and this is actually the other type of hegemony, the sort of cultural hegemony that the United mm. States has, is that uh, people have spent their entire careers believing that the Saudi alliance Alliance is crucial to the Middle East, believing that the United States needs to be forever dominant in the Middle East. I think what you're going to see is people around our age, when people our age start getting into power, people who are just less connected um, to these old strategic environments, you're going to see pr pretty quick shifts. I mean, I would say that in the last three, four, five years, you've really seen the creation of new post post-Cold War alliances. If you think the last 30 years, we're still kind of defined by the strategic alliances of the Cold War. Uh, the last five years, you begin to see that break down with, for example, China and Pakistan. They've had connections in the past, but really uniting against India. Uh, you see India and Israel and the United States drawing closer. Uh, you see all of these new arrangements that really reflect new geopolitical conditions. And and, 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 you know, sorry to, to, to interrupt you, DB, and I'm bringing it up on the show all the time because it's fucking insane. Like the Saudis and the Israelis being buddy, but being butt buddies, that just doesn't, they, they're not natural allies in any way, shape or form, obviously outside of the Iran question, but I'm just like. Wow, that's astonishing. It's really interesting. And if you're taking this macro historical perspective, you could say that broadly speaking, the details are more complicated, but broadly speaking, the history of the Middle East has been, and, and since 1945, has been a struggle between uh, essentially secular nationalists, uh, more Islamic oriented powers, and sort of like ol oligarchic monarchs. And so who's the secular nationalist? Is that the UAE and those kind of guys like, like Nasser, right? Like who, who led Egypt like for a long okay. time and then who was uh, Mubarak, um, you know, okay. who, and then who was overthrown, like those types of figures versus okay. the Muslim Brotherhood, more Islamist or like monarchist like Saudi. Um, I think what you're seeing now is the. The, the salience, the importance of Islamism, which really was powerful since the 70s in particular, it's been about 50 years and it didn't really get what people wanted necessarily. So I think it's becoming less and less important. And that allows Saudi Arabia, you know, where Mecca is, you know, literally the Mecca, mm. to ally with Israel because it's just not as important to what might be called the Muslim, what is often called the Muslim street you know, the average Muslim throughout what it, what might be thought of as the Islamic world. Uh, I think the Palestinian issue is less and less salient for many, many reasons. And so it allows Saudi Arabia to ally with Israel and the United States, uh, which is ironic, of course, because bin Laden was a Saudi who was so mad at American troops being stationed in Saudi Arabia during the Gulf War that he founded his whole, uh, he founded Al Qaeda. And so it's, it, you see these things change very quickly. All right. And because I want to get you out of here, DB, um, I want you to explain to the people when they watch the news um, and when they listen to politicians on both sides of the aisle talk about how China is taking over the world and it's going to be over. And, you know, and I think honestly, I think a lot of the rhetoric because because the rhetoric does come from both sides of the aisles about how evil China is and the sweatshops. And this is like, there's been this branding of China as this other sort of man, almost like a slave state type of type of branding that has happened here in America. But I want to explain to our viewers why they should be a bit skeptical of this idea. One is China is this huge boogeyman. Um, and to, and not to say that China is not, doing their government is getting it right. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about in comparison to us in the United States of, States of America and why we need to constantly have this fucking aggressive posture towards them. Please explain to the people why it's bullshit. <laughs> sure. Well, I, I, on, on the first thing is just it's no comparison between global presence, right? Again, U.S. 750 places, China one or two bases. The U.S. spends more th th on its military than the next 10 countries combined. So just in pure material facts, the United States has nothing to fear. But I would say even beyond that, when you're looking at the actions of the Chinese state in terms of geopolitics, I think China wants to dominate the Eastern 
East Asia. Let's, I don't think China thinks it's going to conquer India, but I think China wants to do- dominate what might be thought of as the Sinosphere of general East Asia. What's, what does China dominating East Asia look for, like, would say Japan? What, what would that mean? Right. That basically, just like kind of everyone in the Western Hemisphere needs to look to the United States, China wants that. China mm. wants Japan to look to it. It wants Indonesia to look to it. It wants the Philippines, South Korea, North Korea, obviously, to look to it, right? Just like Latin America, Mexico can invade Venezuela without talking to the United States, for right. example, right? So that's what it that's what they want. But I think that people often pointed to the so-called Belt and Road Initiative, which is essentially like a developmentalist initiative that was um, – put forward by President Xi Jinping uh, and that, that did a lot of developments in Africa and elsewhere as sort of example, an example of China's global ambitions. But I think we've seen in the last year, both the scaling back of that initiative, and I would also say in consequence of it, China doesn't want to dominate the world like the US or the Soviet Union wanted to do in parts of the world like it did during the Cold War. It's totally wrong. Now, I just want to reiterate, China's government's not getting it right. I think civil liberties are important. Freedom of speech is important. <laughs> Freedom of association; these are important. What the Chinese government appears to be doing to the Uyghurs looks looks generally horrible, generally horrible and awful. Um, however, um, what the United States does in terms of its mass incarcerated population is also generally awful. I don't think that China hmm. should invade the United States, and I don't think the United States should invade China. Um, so, I think one of the most important things we need to do in the coming years is really prevent this sort of rhetoric uh, and ideology coming to the fore of ma- basically making a new Cold War with China. If anything, we need to deal with China. To address global problems like climate change and inequality. Wow, DB, beautifully said. This was fucking amazing. <laughs> you killed it. I want to thank you, of course, for coming on. Nice Long Island boy that you are. Um, and just, you know, obviously you're incredible at what you do. Uh, I think the people that listen to this show are going to be very happy with the results of this convo. Um, you just gave us, you made us so much smarter in basically a 40 minute time span. That's why I guess you get the big bucks at Washington University, at University of Washington up there in Seattle, my boy. But thank you so, 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 so much. Tell the people where they can find you, DB. Uh, sure. You could follow me on Twitter uh, at D Bessner. And if you want, you could buy my book. It's called Democracy in Exile. Yes. And uh, Waz, thanks so much for having me on. I always have a great time. <laughs> Of course. All right, guys, make sure you subscribe to every single Count the Dings property. Of course, uh, Cinephobe. Make sure you're listening to the OG show on Monday. Make sure you're listening to Growing Up the Same on Friday here on the Bomb Feed. Of course, we got the Friday mailbag where we answer listener questions. Um, And if you can, I know it's tough times for most people, but if you can spare yourself, you know, a a fancy cup of coffee per month, um, please become a Patreon at um, patreon.com backslash Count the Dings. Uh, but that's how we give you all this incredible content, man. Get you to talk to smart ass people like DB um, on here. And so for Rob Lopez, for my brother Nando, who's not here, but he's still maintaining um, for DB, our special guest. I'm Big Waz. We out of here. Peace.